Thank you very much. The next item of business is topical questions, and we start with question number one from Alistair Allen. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Prime Minister's reported position that the proposed Brexit deal ensures that the UK will be an independent coastal state with full control over its waters. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding Officer, the withdrawal agreement reached by the UK Government risks being very damaging to Scotland's seafood interests, with an explicit linkage of trade and access to UK waters in direct contradiction to what was promised by the UK government in their very own white paper on fisheries. Because of the UK government's actions, we will have no ability to take part in fisheries negotiations during the transition period and risk having access to Scottish waters and quota traded away by the UK government on a permanent basis to secure a trade deal with the EU in the long term. Under the deal, Scottish seafood exporters to the EU also face the risk of significant and devastating new trade barriers. In relation to the salmon industry alone, it's uh, estimated that an extra, I'll say that again, signing off because of the interruptions from my left. It's estimated that an extra 45,000 export health certificates will need to be issued per annum as a significant cost to both businesses and public authorities. Based on that, I cannot share the Prime Minister's reported view that the UK will be an independent coastal state with full control over its waters. What I can conclude is that in the Prime Minister's eyes, Scottish seafood interests appear to be expendable. Well Alistair Allen. I thank the Minister for uh, his reply and given the concerning information in it, uh, will he comment further, given that Scotland is a net exporter of seafood, as he says, unlike the rest of the UK, and with the vast majority of the UK fisheries and aquaculture sector being Scottish, can the Scottish Government confirm what role it has had in negotiations when it comes to these vitally important sectors? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the UK Government has not uh, involved us in any way whatsoever in response to uh, uh, Dr. Alan's uh, point, and that's despite the fact, presiding officer, that, that I have myself, the Scottish Government, uh, has taken part in the negotiations in Brussels for the last two years. And I can tell you, we have kept, unlike some of the members of the Conservative Party in their own cabinet, we've respected confidentiality in those negotiations. But despite that, we have, despite asking for being fully involved in the negotiations, we have played no part, we have not been able to provide a part, we have been prevented from taking part in those negotiations, which appear to have such a, a disappointing and frankly, potentially damaging outcome. Alistair Allen. Uh, well, again, I thank the Minister. Uh, given uh, the, uh, uh, what he's indicated about the uh, actual withdrawal agreement and uh, what we know now about the links uh, to access to waters with uh, access to trade of fish and seafood exports. Uh, will he also be aware of uh, the value of uh, fresh seafood like langoustines, scallops uh, and other species, some of which is caught and landed in and around the waters of my constituency? Uh, and can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to explain in more detail the sorts of issues that this industry faces if it loses tariff and barrier free trade with the EU and how we might uh, take steps to prevent disruption to this lucrative export trade? Cabinet Secretary. Well, in answer to the questions, the, uh, the shellfish sector faces particular concerns. They face the possible imposition of tariffs and non-tariff barriers because uh, shellfish, uh, prized, in, prized in Europe uh, 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 and throughout the world, because shellfish are obviously perishable, a delay even of a few hours, presiding officer, can be fatal and can render valueless uh, fresh produce uh, such as shellfish. And the imposition of new export certification requirements uh, in a market which hitherto has been a frictionless market uh, is also of grave uh, concern. What can we do to ameliorate it? Well, of course, our own pr preference is to remain in the EU, to remain in the single market and to remain in the customs union. And that's what we can do to solve that threat of that particular problem. But we have also because we are always constructive, we have also proposed an alternative scenario in Scotland's our place in Europe, which would see us continue to seek frictionless trade 
uh, whilst coming out of the CFP. Peter Chapman to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, President Officer. And quite frankly, everybody needs to calm down a bit here. Nothing, nothing has been traded away on fishing. Yeah. No red lines have been crossed on fishing. The Prime Minister has been very clear that nothing will be traded away. Yeah. President Macron would like French fishermen to continue fishing in their waters. Shock horror. He was always going to say that. Yeah. We have never said no EU boats will ever be able to fish in our waters again. But if they fish, it will be under our control and under our rules. Right. And uh, I would just ask, will the Minister confirm that my understanding is correct, that the SNP position on fishing is to rejoin the CFP at the earliest opportunity? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. It, it is not correct, and I disagree with everything that Mr Chapman has just said. So that's an answer to his, his question. I've never seen, presiding officer, the Conservative Party so divided as it is now, with the MP for Murray castigating the plan that Mr Chapman thinks is the bee's knees. But Mr Chapman seems to be unaware of what has happened over the past couple of weeks, where hitherto the UK government said that fisheries and trade must not be linked. Now they're umbilically linked. And if uh, they're umbilically linked, if the EU doesn't get the deal that it wants, uh, then uh, fish and aquaculture will find themselves uh, uh, out of the customs union and facing tariffs and non-tariff barriers. And moreover, following the agreement of the political declaration 25th of November, the European Council released a statement in which it signaled, signaled its intention, and I quote from this, this statement, to demonstrate particular vig vigilance to protecting fishing enterprises and to seek to, quotes, build on inter alia existing reciprocal assets and quota shares. That implies that the position taken by the European Council is to seek even more access to our waters than they, they do at, currently at the time. Uh, the fact that Mr Chapman refuses to, to recognise the existence of all this over the past couple of weeks is further proof positive of the total disarray his party is in on this matter. Rhoda Grant to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I take the Cabinet Secretary back to the transition agreement where a uh, UK access and quota to UK waters um, will be set by the EU in consultation, but they are not bound um, by any obligation to get consent from the UK. I wonder, given that he has relationships with colleagues in the EU, whether he has spoken to them or had any discuss discussions with them about how they'll exercise those powers in the interim period during transition and what safeguards he could then offer to our fishing communities. Cabinet Secretary. Well, my uh, officials have uh, regular negotiations and discussions uh, with colleagues in order precisely to get the best possible deal uh, year, year on year at the, at the fisheries negotiations, which culminate in December, but most of the work is actually done prior to December uh, with EU countries and also with Norway and the Faroes, as the member uh, well knows. It is abundantly clear, however, that the EU uh, countries that have a fishing interest are determined to seek to protect their interests. This was abundantly clear to everybody except apparently the Tories. Uh, my job is to champion the interests of the fishing sector uh, and including the farm fish sector, the aquaculture sector, which has been dragged into this at the last moment with no discussion with the Scottish Government or indeed with the aquaculture sector. And of course, there is really only a Scottish aquaculture sector. As far as I'm aware, there is no significant interest south of the border in aquaculture. Uh, so aquaculture has been thrown to the lions by the UK Government without so much as a buy your leave. But we will seek to get the best possible outcome for Scottish fishermen, despite the complete shambles of the Brexit Burek that's being perpetrated by the Conservatives. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It should have been perfectly obvious all the way along that a link would be made between access to waters and access to markets. Uh, it's also equally clear that uh, if we want a, a sustainable approach to fisheries, a healthy marine environment, it can't be done without international cooperation. So some form of common policy on fisheries is inevitable. Isn't it the case that this is simply one more example of the fundamental dishonesty of the Leave campaigners who tried to pretend that we could return to some sort of isolationist approach on this issue 
and that neither Scottish nor British jingoism changes any of that. Um, well, I, I do agree with, with very much uh, of what Mr Harvey has said, not something that's necessarily, presiding officer, a daily occurrence. Um, but he is right to, to say that the problems which have arisen are problems that are perfectly foreseeable. And indeed, I have asked over the past two years uh, Mrs Ledsom, Mr Gove, Mr Eustace, uh, to give uh, an unequivocal assurance that they would not trade away uh, permanent access to our waters uh, in any part of a Brexit deal. Uh, they never provided that assurance, and it's now abundantly clear why. Because uh, in reaching an agreement to agree on fishing, they have postponed that decision for purely political reasons, because they know fine well that they are not going to be able to deliver on the promises that were made in the Leave campaign. In short, the Brexiteers overpromised, and now they're ready to under-deliver. Thank you. We turn to question number two, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce the incidence of neonatal abstinence syndrome. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our new combined <coughs> alcohol and drug strategy will focus on how services can adapt to meet the needs of those most in need, recognising that high risk factors such as alcohol and drug use impact on health outcomes at birth, in infancy, and across the whole life course. In addition, our maternity services are being reshaped under the best start to ensure that all vulnerable women, including those with substance use issues, receive continuity of midwifery care from specialist midwives who will coordinate the team care for the woman and, for the woman and her baby. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful for that answer. Um, the Liberal Democrat Freedom of Information request revealed the very sad statistic that 200 babies a year are born with this condition. That's, put it simply, that's a baby born every other day addicted to substances. It's the worst possible start in life. Yet the draft strategy had nothing around neonatal abstinence syndrome. Uh, will she confirm that the new strategy, uh, which I believe will be published this week, will address that? And does she also accept that her government's 23% cut to alcohol and drug partnership services actually made this situation far worse? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm sure Mr. Cole Hamilton knows that it would be inappropriate uh, for me to comment on what is in the detail of what is in that uh, drug strategy in advance of its publication tomorrow. What I can say is that it is a strategy that has quite rightly put this as a uh, core health matter and a public health matter that is focused on the individual uh, and not on any other issues. Uh, and as I know from his meeting with Mr. Fitzpatrick in August, uh, he took uh, what I understand to be reassurance in terms of what would be included in that strategy. So I'm sure the points that he has made uh, will have been uh, taken account of. What I can uh, say, though, is clearly that the twin approach of that new al combined alcohol and drug strategy and our work in reshaping maternity services recognises the importance of uh, dealing with these issues in the manner I've outlined. And I should also make the point in terms of uh, the mental health work that my colleague, Ms. Hockey, is taking forward and was in our programme for government, the recognition of perinatal mental health, which is really important and connected here to these matters, uh, is central to that work as well. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you. I'm grateful for that answer also. It is clear that being born addicted to drugs is one of the worst possible starts in life that one can experience. Yet still we don't routinely capture adverse childhood experiences as prescribed by Sir Harry Burns in his review of NHS targets. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm when she will act on this recommendation, routinely capture ACEs so we can direct support to these vulnerable children from the very beginning? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to... Uh, Mr. Cole Hamilton, for that uh, further question, he is, of course, absolutely right that being born uh, with this uh, syndrome is indeed one of the worst starts in life. And, and I, I should have said at the outset that I'm grateful to him for raising this whole question at all in the manner in which he has done. Uh, he is right uh, in terms of that recommendation from Sir Harry Burns. Uh, I'm working with my colleagues now to, uh, in, to identify exactly how we can take that forward and in what way. And I'm uh, happy to commit to ensuring that Mr. Cole Hamilton is advised of that uh, as soon as possible. Tom Arthur to be followed by Brian Whittle. Uh, 
Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary set out how much the Scottish Government has invested over the past decade to tackle drug and alcohol misuse, on top of the financial commitments ready made this year? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you to Mr Arthur. The Scottish Government has invested over £746 million to tackle problem alcohol and drug use since 2008. This includes £53.8 million allocated in this financial year. The majority of this funding has gone towards supporting local prevention, treatment and recovery services. And in addition, we allocated a further £20 million this year and for each of the remaining years of this Parliament in order to improve the provision and quality of the services. And Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Just to ask the Scottish Government uh, what it's doing to ensure that there's adequate numbers of trained staff available to help expectant mothers who uh, recognise the dangers of alcohol during pregnancy. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> uh, thank you. I'm grateful to Mr Whittle for that answer because it gives me the opportunity to remind him that for the eighth year in a row, I very recently announced uh, a further increase in the number of student nurse and midwifery places in Scotland. Uh, in order to ensure that we have the right staffing numbers in that regard. And of course, I'm sure he will recall our commitment to in increase uh, the number of health visitors and the training work that is underway in that regard. Health visitors are a very, very important resource in terms of working uh, with families and uh, small children uh, immediately after birth and on into those early years. Thank you very much to the Cabinet Secretary and members.